Hello and welcome to Beyond Japan, an interdisciplinary podcast that looks at the broad reach of Japanese studies from within and beyond Japan. This podcast is brought to you by the Center for Japanese Studies at the Centre Institute for the Study of Japanese Arts and Cultures, in collaboration with the University of East Anglia. I'm your host, Oliver Moxham, Project Support Officer at the Centre Institute and Researcher of Japanese War Heritage. This week we are joined by Professor Fabio Rambelli, Lecturer at the University of California's Department of East Asian Languages and Cultural Studies, as well as International Shinto Foundation Chair in Shinto Studies, to discuss Gagaku, a traditional form of Japanese music which has endured to the modern day largely unchanged for over a thousand years. I'll be asking Fabio about the cultural significance of court music in modern Japan, who played it and why, and the global interest in Buddhist culture both tangible and intangible. We hope you enjoy the show. Good morning, Fabio. Thank you for joining me on the podcast today. Good morning. My pleasure. (laughs) So first of all, we'd like to know a bit more about you. Can you tell us about your area of expertise and how your interests have brought you there? Yeah, uh, with pleasure. Okay, so, well, I work on Japanese religions, mostly from the perspective of intellectual and cultural history, in the sense that I'm not really, I'm not particularly interested in like theological discussions or uh, doctrines or beliefs, but I'm more interested in the impact that certain ideas had, you know, on regular life, let's say, on how certain ideas emerged out of specific um, social and cultural contexts. And my special focus is on pre-modern Japan. So I started by working on um, Shingon Buddhism, you know, esoteric Buddhism, and especially the semiotic doctrines that they developed, you know, theories about language and science, and moved on to um, uh, practices about the amalgamation and vernacularization uh, of Buddhism in Japan. So that will be uh, what is called in Japanese uh, Shinbutsu Shugo, you know, the amalgamation of Kami and Buddhas. And now I'm exploring more freely, let's say, a range of other phenomena that are more or less related to the religious culture of early modern Japan. I see. Great. Well, let's begin with the basics around gagaku. The term literally means elegant music, and it refers to a type of classical Japanese music with its origins in the 10th century Kyoto Imperial Palace, mixing earlier Japanese music with styles from continental Asia. Could you expand on the history of gagaku and tell us what the function of it was in court? Uh, yes, uh, with pleasure again. Um, well, first of all, let me make a, a, a little connection with what I just said before about my area of expertise. <laughs> because uh, I think that gagaku is an important part of the religious culture of uh, pre-modern Japan that has been m- mostly ignored by scholars of religious studies. And this being kind of, you know, left to musicologists. The reason I'm saying this is that all the large temples and the large Shinto shrines in pre-modern Japan, and many of them even today, they still employ gagaku for their ceremonies and rituals. So, I mean, it goes beyond the, the imperial court of Japan. And, you know, I will say a few words about this in a moment. But let me begin with the definition. You you rightly said, you know, it's normally translated as elegant music. Here, I think it is important to point out that elegant here is not uh, in the sense of like fashionable, but uh, the nuance here is more like cultivated and correct, appropriate. And that is opposed to like so-called vulgar and uncultivated music of commoners. So this is a special <laughs> music that was devised for ceremonies, right? In that sense, it's elegant. And the origins, in fact, in Japan go further back than the 10th century. Certainly by the 600s, there are musicians at temples, Buddhist temples, playing antecedents of what uh, Gagaku became. The Imperial Office of Music, uh, Gagaku Ryo, is established in 701. So what happens in the 10th century and 11th century is the the creation of new pieces by Japanese authors based on the repertoire, you know, continental repertoire that they already had. So so that is a kind of an interesting phenomenon because you see a lot of new pieces being composed in Japan. Many of the pieces in the repertoire even today are in fact uh, Japanese uh, creations. So there is this idea that Gagaku all comes from the continent, but a large part of it, I mean, a significant portion of the repertoire was really made in Japan in the 10th, 11th centuries. 
Now the functions, well, at court, uh, well, now it's very different, of course, but until the end of the uh, Tokugawa period, there were a lot of ceremonies being held at court, and many of these ceremonies involved uh, religious aspects. So you had ceremonies related to Buddhism, you have Shinto-like ceremonies and all, of, you know, and so forth. And the most important ones involved the performance of music and Gagaku in particular. The imperial court also sponsored ceremonies at temples and shrines outside of the palace. And again, those large ceremonies also involved the performance of Gagaku. So this is in a, an, important, an important component of the role of Gagaku throughout the ages. So ceremonies, and ceremonies could be for the state or the court, but also for temples and shrines. But again, sponsored by the imperial court. And then you have also entertainment purposes for which Gagaku was used, like parties of aristocrats or uh, like even personal enjoyment. You know, you have records of people like strumming the biwa and singing, for example, right? So these are all, you know, it's a part of a complex uh, culture of refinement and rituality, I think that was essential for the court. Now, the Tokugawa Bakufu also adopts uh, Gagaku and they create a Gagaku Academy uh, in the Edo Castle and one at uh, Nikko Toshogu. And they do, did that, you know, to kind of replicate what the court does in Kyoto. So again, Gagaku was used by the Shogun for ceremonies involving the ancestors of the Shogun and especially Tokugawa Ieyasu. So there is this kind of duplication of what the court does with music at the Edo castle and the leading samurai uh, families also in their domains also introduced the Gagaku orchestras in the mid Edo period. So, you know, it is an important part of the ceremonial culture of Japan that is often overlooked in its scope and breadth and depth. I see. Uh, could you explain why it's been overlooked academically? This is an interesting thing that I cannot really figure out myself. <laughs> um, um, I think it is related to general academic trends. For example, even in Europe, right, we do study art history. We don't study the history of music in high school, for example, or in, uh, in junior high. And I wonder why. Because again, music was as important as art, you know, in the development of the Western civilization. So I think that something like that, you know, the exclusion of music also happened in Japan with modernization. So that, first of all, in religious studies, they focused on doctrines and texts, right? Only later on, you know, they began to focus on material culture and, uh, and uh, visual culture and statues and icons and all that. Um, the sensory aspect of sound, I think, is still pretty much outside of the field of religious studies as a whole. So, um, again, and it has been relegated to musicology. But again, musicologists, traditionally, they do what uh, old Buddhologists did, right? You know, focus on texts and scores. <laughs> and um, without looking at the ways in which these texts and scores were performed, or at least not very much. And basically, you know, what I'm trying to say is that the social and cultural history of Gagaku is still pretty much on the, you know, the making. Mm, yeah, definitely. I know that in heritage studies, that intangible heritage is only just sort of being incorporated into the wider heritage field too. So music is part of that, definitely. Right. And I wonder, you know, so the, the, the academic situation in Japan is pretty much modeled after the, you know, the West, the modern Western academia. So I guess uh, looking at the West for a moment could be helpful to identify the basic trends. But for example, in Europe, we have this idea that at some point, you know, the, the poet or the or the writer becomes a kind of uh, embodiment of the um, spirit of a nation, right? <laughs> you have the, like Bard, you know, Shakespeare, or uh, you have Goethe, or people like that. So literature, for example, becomes part of the definition of a culture and a country. A similar process also happens with certain visual artists, right? You have Michelangelo or Leonardo uh, becoming embodiments of uh, high and deep values. Music has been kind of removed from that discourse, right? Of course, we hear Bach and Beethoven and Mozart and others, but my sense is that they're not on the same level as, you know, the main literary figures or the main artists. And I wonder if it is also related to social status, because again, musicians were perhaps not as important as writers in terms of class. I mean, I don't know. I mean, this is something that is puzzling to me. And something like that, I think, is also happening in Japan. 
the essence, let's say, of Japanese culture has been imagined as being embodied by literature first and then the visual arts later. Hmm. It's a fascinating revelation. I hadn't thought of it that way. You see how I'm trying to, uh, to, to, to wrap my head around, you know, this, uh, this exclusion of music from the mainstream of uh, like cultural discourses. Fascinating. To uh, go back to Gayaku, uh, could you explain for us what kind of instruments were involved? And if possible, could you describe the sound for any unfamiliar listeners? Right. So, well, there are different configurations of Gagaku. Well, let's say the, the standard uh, orchestra, the image that we normally associate with it, is composed of three groups of instruments. So there are the woodwinds, three different kinds, and then there are string instruments, two kinds, and percussion instruments, three kinds. So the woodwinds are uh, the hichiriki, which is a kind of uh, oboe, let's say. It's a, do it's a double reed uh, instrument. And the Hichiriki plays the leading role in the melody. And uh, it's a very loud instrument. <laughs> and then there is the Ryuteki or um, different types of flute. But anyway, a uh, flute that is also very loud and very high pitched. And that is, is kind of a counter melody. It's kind of parallel to the melody of the Hichiriki with some variations. And then there is the show, the third woodwind instrument in the orchestra. The show is a mouth organ made with bamboo and wood with reeds and it plays like sound clusters, like chords, let's say. And that kind of accompanies the melody. What is interesting is that the sound clusters of the show are above the melody, not below, like in Western music, right? When the, the chords and the accompaniment is, uh, is on a lower octave than the, than the main melody. The show is on top of the other instruments. So it's kind of a harmony from above. It's also interesting that the harmony that we have in the West is based on thirds, right? Chords are made of intervals of thirds. And uh, the show, the clusters are based on fourths and fifths. So it's kind of a more archaic uh, system of harmony. So these are the three wind instruments. And then the strings are uh, biwa, which is a kind of a lute, uh, simplified lute with four strings, and uh, sono koto, which is a kind of koto. But uh, in gagaku it's played, um, well, the tunings are different, and it's played with a different uh, hand uh, technique. And the three percussion instruments, you know, there is a kakko, which is a kind of a hourglass shaped drum. And then uh, you have the shoko, which is a small gong, and the taiko, a big drum that, you know, marks the larger, let's say, rhythm patterns of each piece. I mentioned that the hichiriki and the ryuteki, the flutes, uh, so the, the wind instruments are very loud because gagaku was originally meant to be played outside, you know, in large open spaces. So, of course, it was important for it to be heard. Inside the rooms, um, I don't know, I guess we have to think about, you know, classical like Heian or um, Kamakura architecture in Japan, when you have like wooden structures and tatami mats and folding screens. And I think that those, I would imagine, that they were kind of reducing the more noisy uh, um, overtones of the instruments and reduce also the volume. But Gagaku is mostly for outside performances. Now, the Biwa and the Sono Koto are not very loud at all. And in fact, they were used, you know, for like personal playing inside like smaller rooms in the palace, like accompanying singing or perhaps accompanying a wind instrument or just a solo instrument. Uh, this would be probably hard for people who listen to Gagaku the first time, but you know, with the repeated listening, you can notice how each instrument is finally interlocking with the other instruments in each piece. For example, you have the show that comes in before the, 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 the chord changes, so introduces a development in the melody and the flute comes in together with it, and then the hichiriki then again moves to the, to the next development the melody. The string instruments play kind of arpeggios, and so they highlight the modal uh, content, the scales of the melody, but also kind of the rhythm um, with which a piece unfolds. It's, uh, it, it's quite amazing to see how, again, each instrument is finely interlocking with each other in, in a, with a tempo, with a rhythm that is relatively, relatively free. So it's quite fascinating. Yeah, it sort of reminds me of perhaps a, a large orchestra with all these different pieces accompanying each other. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yes, yeah, yeah. 
Right. Although the musicians don't know the parts of the other instruments uh, or not necessarily. So they really have to listen to what the others are doing. And it takes a lot of practice to do it. So there is this very interesting relation between the written score and the actual performance, which again applies to all music. But in Gagaku, that's particularly relevant. It's a particularly important aspect. See, thank you for the helpful description. I know it can be difficult to describe sound just through words. So if any listeners are interested, I'll have links in the description to listen to some Gagaku music. It's also interesting to understand how the, um, uh, like the ancient Japanese envisioned the instruments. For example, the ryuteki is literally the sound of a dragon and it's meant to reproduce the voice of a dragon. And uh, we normally in the West don't imagine the dragon with a flute voice, right? <laughs> the hichiriki is, is the sound of a kalavinka, a mythical Indian bird that lives in some kind of Buddhist paradise which again, we don't normally associate like the melodious voice of birds with the hichiriki. The show is the sound of a phoenix, you know, the mythological Chinese bird. So I think it's kind of interesting to see how, again, different cultures imagine sounds and particular like mythological or supernatural entities and how, and, and, and their sounds and their voices. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so in that sense, when people were listening to this music in the contextual time period, would they be imagining these mythical creatures while listening to it? <laughs> Uh, well, they were aware of it, and in fact, in many sources from the Heian period and beyond, they do mention, you know, they say, oh, I heard the Hichiriki and it really reminded me of the Kalavinka, or, you know, <laughs> or these kind of things. So <laughs> there's this, this association, but th that is kind of interesting because, again, those mules, uh, Gagaku was always related to some kind of ceremony, and especially Buddhist ceremonies in pre-modern Japan. So the association between Gagaku and the Buddhist paradise, the pure land, is very, very clear. So, and of course, nobody has heard the sound of the, of the pure land, but they use Gagaku to imagine it. You also see that in visual representations of the, of like Amida, for example, coming to this world to save somebody and take him or her to the, to the pure land. And Amida is very often accompanied by an orchestra of Gagaku musicians. So there, is, there was this very clear association, I think, in the, in the minds of the few Japanese who could hear Gagaku at the time, of course, that, that that was a kind of a supernatural kind of transcendent music. And so they used these references, you know, to mythological animals to, to represent it. That's fascinating. So Gagaku has remained largely unchanged since its inception over a thousand years ago. Have the musicians who play it changed over time, or is it still largely reserved to the imperial family's ears? For that matter, is there any popularity around Gagaku amongst the general public in Japan today? Right, yes. You see, um, Gagaku, I think, is a very good example of what we describe as continuity in the Japanese tradition. You know, we, we tend to see Japan or traditional Japanese culture as largely unchanging. And in the case of Gagaku, it is true in part, but it is also not true in other parts. And let me try to explain. So, for example, the instruments haven't changed and uh, there has been no technical improvement in any of them, which is quite remarkable, right? So the instruments of Gagaku are still made with the same materials and the same techniques as 1000 years ago, if not even earlier. And we know that because we have manuals, we have like books that tell us how to make instruments from the 12th century, for example, and they are exactly the same as today. We also have Gagaku instrument stores that the Shoso in Nara, you know, the Imperial Repository. And again, they are pretty much like the instruments that we have now. So this is quite remarkable. Another remarkable aspect is the repertoire that is played today is still the same past ages with the oldest pieces dating back to the 700s. And then a few others, like I said, that were written in the 10th or 11th centuries. So there is a significant component of continuity and the musicians, the Imperial Household Agency, you know, the Gagaku Orchestra there, the musicians there are still the descendants of the same families who have been playing Gagaku since the Nara period, if not earlier, which again is quite remarkable. However, there have been changes and significant ones. There's been a simplification of techniques, many of which are lost. We find them in notations and we don't know what they mean, for example. There's been a reduction in repertoire with many pieces that went lost, you know, or during the centuries. The scores do remain, many scores remain, and some people have tried to reconstruct those. But again, uh, we don't really know how they sounded back then. 
In particular, solo pieces for Biwa and Koto have been abandoned. And so, again, there are attempts uh, trying to reconstruct them. And vocal pieces, you know, like songs from the Heian period, which was like an important part of the Gagaku repertoire, they've been um, lost and th they began to reconstruct in the Edo period. So another change is that uh, the Imperial uh, Household Agency, in modern times, they began to hire uh, musicians that are not from the traditional families. And so, I mean, just a few of them, but still that is a remarkable change. So, uh, you know, I hope I'm clear here that, you know, there is a remarkable continuity, but also some significant changes uh, throughout, the, throughout the ages. In terms of popularity, actually, you would be surprised to hear that there is a significant number of people in Japan who are learning Gagaku actively uh, today, really a lot. I mean, I would think uh, thousands of people. There's increasing interest. The concerts of Gagaku are always full. Whenever there is an orchestra playing, I mean, not only the Imperial Orchestra, uh, those are always full, you know, their performances, but also other like private uh, orchestras or um, ensembles affiliated with temples and shrines, the performances are always full. So people learning, there are a couple of places, uh, universities where you can learn Gagaku instruments and practice there. There are private academies where you can learn. So um, that is kind of interesting. I mean, to see this uh, diffusion of interest and, uh, and the increase uh, of people practicing it. And now, uh, something that is interesting, and maybe we can say something later if you're interested in this, is that uh, there are many international composers, you know, writing, you know, composers of contemporary music who are writing for Gagaku instruments. And not only in Japan, but I would say, especially uh, 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 outside of Japan, which is again, quite remarkable. Uh, in, you know, in terms of development of this tradition. Yeah, that's amazing. There's a point I'd like to pick up on earlier when you said how the the way the instruments are made hasn't changed. I know that in, with some Western instruments, for example, you have the Swa Stradivarius of violins and these expertly crafted instruments which are worth magnificent sums of money. Is there any kind of comparable prestige amongst Gagaku instruments? There are uh, very few ancient instruments dating back to the Edo period. So you find them in the market sometimes and they're very, very expensive, obviously. Honestly, I don't know of any um, instrument or instrument maker uh, of Gagaku instruments that have the same reputation as the Stradivarius, for example. But um, yeah, also because again, most of those Edo period or older instruments are now stored at museums, so it's impossible to buy them. Anyway, and there are a few names of makers that, you know, sometimes they inscribe them in the instruments. So there is something similar to it, but I don't think it's a thing among Gagaku players. I mean, as far as I know, I know that among the um, artisans, the professionals who make instruments today, there are different degrees of reputation. You know, some people are considered to be better than others. I think a lot of it is a matter of personal taste or like traditional affiliations uh, or, you know, patronage, I suppose. So who makes the instrument is important in Japan today for the professional musicians, of course. <laughs> These are instruments that are made to order and it takes months to have, uh, to have one made. And some of the processes, you know, involved in making, for example, the reeds of the, of the show, uh, you have to collect them, you have to find the right ones, then you have to boil them for several hours and then you have to let them sit for years sometimes to dry. And in, and in order to be able to use them, you know, for a good instrument. So it's a very, very long process. So, you know, beyond the three, four months that it might take to get an instrument done, I mean, the preparation can be exceedingly long. So again, it's a different type of artifacts. Even in Japan, I mean, people are not used to this thing. Yeah, fascinating. So even though the process of making these things hasn't changed, it's by no means a simple process then, you see. So I understand that you have learned to play the shawl, uh, a bamboo mouth organ used in Kagaku, as you mentioned. Can you tell us about your experience learning to play and what resources and other skills you might need to learn such a specialized instrument? Oh, <laughs> you see, the show has always been my passion since I was uh, an undergraduate in, in college. And finally, a few years ago, I was in Japan for an extended time and I decided to begin to learn it. So I went to this academy is a Shinto shrine in, in Tokyo that has an old uh, Gagaku uh, academy there. And I was able to learn with, uh, with Maestro Bunno Hideaki, who is the 45th, I think, generation of the Bunno family. 
who have been playing the show for the emperor since before the Nar period even. So it is an amazing instrument. And the most, uh, let's say, the, the learning curve was pretty steep. Okay, I, I, I play the saxophone and the flute myself. I play jazz and all kinds of, you know, and this kind of thing. So going into Gagaku was really, I mean, I really had to unlearn how to, <laughs> how, how to deal with the wind instrument. First of all, the show, you blow in and out and you never stop. You're never supposed to stop playing, even if the song is like 30 minutes. Oh, wow. um, you have to dose your breathing and there are like standardized ways you do that. So that was something that was important to breathe. You know, I play the saxophone, I can hold a lot of breath, but the kind of regular control that is involved in playing gagaku is very different from what I was used to. But again, breathing is really the central component of this instrument. And then the other one is the very small finger movements that are expected. Basically, the finger movements are almost invisible. <laughs> so you really have to achieve this uh, perfect control of your hands and, uh, and the interaction between you and your instrument, which is as uh, impactful and as little visible as possible. Uh, all instruments have, you know, this particular interaction with the human body, right? But, but the show in, in, in this kind of minimalism, right? The minimal movements that are necessary was kind of um, challenging initially. And also the synchronization with other instruments, which again is important for any ensemble in any kind of music. But with the show, I think is a little more complicated because like I said, you know, whether, even though the, the, the tempo is, is fixed more or less and the notation is written and all that, still there are some variables that really depend on the, on the performance and the performers. So like listening carefully to the other show players in the ensemble and the other instrument is really central to what you're doing. So there is this very uh, important coordination. So inside the body, right, with breathing, the body itself, with the fingerings, and uh, with everything that happens around you that are crucial for, uh, for learning the instrument. Yeah, I've, I've seen a video of you playing the show on your research profile and the way that you're holding it in front of your face, the continuous flow of breathing. To be doing that continuously for half an hour, it seems more like an endurance sport than music. <laughs> <laughs> or perhaps like a meditation practice or something. You know, a lot of meditation Maybe, is really based yeah. on, on uh, breath control, right? So, well, another aspect, you know, I mean, nobody talks about this and I don't want to overemphasize the meditational component because uh, it's not explicitly there. But, you know, you play your instrument so close to your face and normally you play like chords of five or six notes, right, in the classical repertoire. So you can literally hear the different reads vibrating at different speeds, you know, <laughs> because again, you're playing like one centimeter away from your, from your, your face. And that is quite, um, that produces a quite remarkable effect. I don't know how to describe, but you really hear like different reads, different sounds, five, six, seven of them um, uh, <laughs> together with different vibrations. It's, uh, it's quite a remarkable experience. Ah, so you can feel it as well as hear it. That's Certainly a unique instrument. Yeah, and recordings don't really do justice to the, to this, you know, um, complexity of the of the vibration of the show. I really don't know how to. Maybe a quadraphonic system or something, right? Would be would be probably closer to to the actual experience. Mm, yeah. So, what do you believe the future of Gagaku to be? We are currently seeing a revival of indigenous music, such as Ainu music from Hokkaido and folk tunes from Okinawa. As a form of high culture, can Gagaku ride on this revival of traditional music too, or is it enjoying its own boom time, as you've mentioned earlier? Mm, this is a good question. Well, I think along the lines of what I just said, I think that there is a growing interest, which is certainly not a mass phenomenon, of course, but there is a growing interest in... Um, in Gagaku, and the fact that more and more uh, Shinto shrines and Buddhist temples are performing it, in addition to you know uh, performances at theaters, uh, concert halls, I think that uh, many more people will be exposed to this music. I mean, not that it's necessary. I mean, this has never been a mass <laughs> phenomenon, right? But uh, I say this in a positive way because again, the more people are exposed to it, perhaps new ideas will come out of it. And uh, this relates to what I said before about, you know, the fact that contemporary composers are writing new music for Gagaku instruments, which is a new development. It really started in the early 60s, in fact. 
and it's been growing like exponentially all over the world. So um, this will uh, result in two different things. I think one will be a revitalization of the repertoire because then Gagaku orchestras or Gagaku musicians can play both the classical repertoire and the contemporary one. And uh, it may also develop into new techniques for the instruments, right? Techniques that are not part of the classical uh, repertoire as well. So this might bring up, um, bring about a revital, revital, revitalization of the tradition and open up new territories, perhaps, right, for, for music. So I see the future uh, at the moment uh, in, in, in a kind of a positive, uh, moving it in, you know, in a positive direction. That's great. It's good to hear of a uh, optimistic future for an intangible heritage, normally they're the ones most under threat of dying out. But yeah, that's great. So many museums across Japan are commemorating the 1400th anniversary of the death of Prince Shotoku Taishi this year with exhibitions of Buddhist artifacts. We at the Sainsbury Institute have also organized such an exhibition at the Sainsbury Center entitled Faces of Faith around early Japanese statuary. Having written on such artifacts in your 2007 book, Buddhist Materiality, A Cultural History of Objects in Japanese Buddhism, what are your thoughts on exhibitions of Buddhist material culture in Japan and elsewhere? Hmm. This is a difficult, complicated question because, again, I'm not an art historian, so I say, you know, I look at these things from the point of view of intellectual history or cultural history, but my sense is that we have been accustomed to um, seeing, for example, like statues or even like uh, scriptures or illustrated scrolls in Japan. So we kind of know what to expect and we know what to appreciate in those in those objects. Recent scholarship has also tried to recontextualize, you know, those icons and images in their, let's say, original context, right? So when we see a statue, we are also told how it was used, what kind of ceremonies it was part of, and, uh, you know, this type of information. The reason I'm saying this is that in, in the case of, like, broader aspects of materiality, like... Um, tools, for example, professional tools, or musical instruments, or swords, we don't really know what these things were, right? And who made them for whom, how they were used, you know, what was their supposed function, and so forth. Some of these objects were made only for ceremonial functions, right? They were never used. Others might have been used for some specific purposes. And so I think we need to train ourselves first and the public also in being able to understand and comprehend what these material objects were about and what kind of heritage they convey, right? Whose heritage and to whom? To me, for example, it's always been kind of a mystery why you go to a museum, an art museum in Japan, and you find all these swords or all these bowls and bento boxes, right? And you find literally no musical instrument on display. If there are, it's really an exception. And to me, a musical instrument is much more beautiful and meaningful object than a weapon, right? <laughs> but again, that also tells us how Japanese culture sees itself, or some people see Japanese culture, right? When the samurai and the swords are more important than, <laughs> than musical instruments, or perhaps bento boxes are more important than musical instruments. So to me, uh, this is something that needs to be questioned and needs to be reconsidered and rearticulated. But um, I think there's also something more to it because a lot of, again, rich, um, material objects had a ritual function and did that sense. They were pretty much similar to icons and religious objects that we see. So perhaps we could explore, you know, the continuity and the ways in which material objects uh, mediate between the secular and the, or the profane, let's say, and the sacred in pre-modern Japanese culture. So I think that there's a lot to do, but I also see a lot of new developments and I'm very excited about this. Oh, and by the way, Shoto Kutaishi was one of the founders, or is considered to be one of the founders of Gagaku, is the one who supposedly established the, the orchestra at uh, Shiten Noji in Osaka, which is the oldest Gagaku orchestra in Japan. So there is this connection too. <laughs> All right, that's interesting. Yeah, just to go back to your point about how little we can know about ancient objects. In an earlier episode I had with Professor Brian Lowe from Princeton about uh, history and myth and trying to divide the two, it seems that the best way we can approach these sort of objects, which don't have a written history to accompany them, is to 
at least provide a context of what it might have been used for and to get in, in the context of a museum is to get visitors to ask those questions themselves, you know, trying to imagine uh, context and situations which they might have been used and really to try and provoke questions rather than provide solid answers. Right. That would be a, certainly a very, very productive way to deal with. Also because we know very little, even if we know how the objects were used, we cannot really reconstruct the entire thing, you know, <laughs> 100%. I mean, that is, that is uh, some no. illusion, <laughs> right? Even if we know that this particular object was used by carpenters in the Muromachi period, we don't know their lives, right? We don't know how, how precious an object like that might, or cheap an object like that might have been at the time. I mean, it requires uh, all kinds of reconstructions. So I think that just pointing out to the difficulties and sometimes even the separation that we have with these objects that seem so, you know, we can touch them literally, right? But um, they don't really tell us much. I think just raising the issue, I think is, uh, is important because again, a cultural heritage, you know, is predicated upon an idea of continuity but a lot of it is really lost in many ways, right? So it's a continuity that we wish was there, but very often it is no longer there. So it, it becomes complicated, I think. And raising these issues, I think uh, it is important also for a better preservation of more aspects of the cultural heritage. Mm, definitely. Thank you for your insights there. And thank you for answering all of my questions. Before we finish the episode, could you share with us what other projects are currently working on? Oh, yes. Uh, well, so my interest here for Gagaku started really with the show, you know, when I started playing the show. And I decided to do a cultural history of that particular object, which will be, you know, in line with my work on materiality. Although again, that involves music, which is more immaterial in many ways. So I'm working on, uh, on a cultural history of the show between materiality and immateriality. And in order to do that, I know I needed to find out more about the history of Gagaku. I guess I'm lucky that I'm doing this now because in the past 10 years or so, there's been an incredible explosion of new research on Gagaku in Japan from the point of view of cultural history. So not only in terms of scores and notations, and, but also, and particularly about who played Gagaku and when and for what reasons and in which context and all that. So it's a very, uh, I think, exciting time to study Gagaku now. And I hope I, you know, I'll be able to finish my, my work on the show, on the, on the history of the show relatively soon. Great. Well, we'll all be looking forward to that. Thank you, Fabio. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. My pleasure. You can find a link to Fabio's research profile in the description below. Next week, we'll be joined by Dr. Daria Milnikova, Robert and Lisa Sainsbury Fellow at the Sainsbury Institute to discuss the art movement of futurism in the early 20th century and how collaborating Russian and Japanese artists within the movement challenged its founding principles and Eurocentric nature. We hope you'll join us then. Thank you for listening.